Okay. So, yeah. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Fergus Dolan here from NALA. Um, delighted to have you here for our webinar today on challenge and engagement in the ESOL classroom. We're delighted to have Dominic Legood uh, facilitating today. Dominic is an English language um, teacher and trainer. And just so you know, I forgot to mention it, uh, we'll be recording this session. So if you don't want, you if you don't fancy that, you can turn off your camera and turn off your microphone. Um, and then we'll be putting the recording onto the NALA YouTube channel. Also, um, Dominic will send me this presentation afterwards and I'll, I'll email it on to everybody who has uh, registered. Okay, over to you, Dominic, all the best. Thanks very much, Fergus, and, and uh, uh, thanks for the introduction. And uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to my, uh, my white room, uh, which I, I like to call the, the cell. And um, there's strategic um, uh, soft walls uh, in here as well. So when I want to kind of bang my head after eight hours of sitting in here and uh, I'm looking at square things, then, um, uh, you know, uh, but look, that, that's the way of life at the moment. And uh, I, I'm missing engaging with people. And uh, it's part of uh, what I love about teaching is the fact that um, I've got that kind of open and interaction. So... I suppose when uh, Fergus asked me today uh, what I wanted to talk about, I thought, well, uh, I need to start at looking at things about kind of challenge and engagement, and especially in this online world where there isn't, there's a complete lack of physicality. And um, so let's begin. Um, first, I thought I would talk about my thoughts of online teaching. And maybe this is an area, ladies and gents, if you want to talk into the chat and, and just kind of concur with me if, if I'm not going completely mental. Um, I kind of think um, this online teaching is kind of good for large scale lectures and, um, and teachers and lecturers who, who just kind of like to plow through things no matter what. Um, I'm sure we've all been there. I can remember... Uh, Tuesday morning after the uh, night out in the student union on a Monday night where um, you'd sit in the lecture theatre in the back right hand corner and fall asleep uh, while the lecturer went on uh, because he was a little bit kind of boring and stuff and so th this is a great you know online teaching is, is great for that type of person who just wants to kind of plow through but for, for me as a teacher who likes to kind of deal with interaction and feedback from people in a kind of a, a physical manner and can see feedback through what people say, then um, I suppose I find this is a real kind of issue in the, uh, what online teaching is doing for us. Um, it's also good, I suppose, if you're a teacher who, uh, I don't know if you remember when you were a kid, I'm from the UK, there was a program called Jack Nori. And Jack Nori was beautiful because um, um, it was just uh, a, a kind of a minor uh, B-list celebrity he used to read a story at the end of the day. And it was kind of like a bedtime story. You could sit back in your chair and you could relax. And it always reminded me of um, a history teacher that I used to have called Mr Gillings. And Mr. Gillings would uh, take you to parts of history with his kind of encyclopedic knowledge. And he would just talk about it to you. And you could sit back in your chair and you'd learn about the Somme or you'd learn about Verdun or what happened at Chartres. And, you know, online teaching would have been great for him because there wasn't any kind of two-way communication. He had the knowledge he had the great presentation skills. He had the ability to kind of just capture people. You would sit down in your chair and, um, and just sit back. I remember students walking into his classroom with cups of tea because they knew that he was going to give them this great story. And as long as you were a person who could kind of internalise what he said and you had the ability to take notes or do something positive with it, then you were just, uh, you were enthralled by his personality. Uh, but again, for me, I find that's a real issue because I need to check in with people. So I'm not that kind of Jack and Ori teacher. Um, other thoughts that I've had 
about online teaching is it's kind of good for a maximum of maybe like one to four for proper interactions. So you've either got large scale lectures, I think it works well for, um, uh, or it works well for kind of like smaller interactions. The score that I'm working at at the moment actually kind of did away with this whole kind of concept of one teacher and 15 students and try to do online teaching. Um, so the school I'm working at at the moment, their focus is there's that everybody joins for registration at the start of the day. And then we set a task and then they go away for 30 minutes. They kind of complete the task and then they're straight into the small breakout rooms for feedback there because teachers were coming in and like, um, like, I feel like I'm uh, sitting in a room and I've got to try and present to 15 people and I'm the only person who's talking all of the time here. I feel like I'm acting, I'm not teaching anymore. There's no interaction. And so, um, you know, it's good to see that people are kind of uh, agreeing with this. There's a huge sense of passivity in students. Uh, and I really feel this uh, with online teaching. And therefore I've started to have to look at, well, how do I come back to this, this passiveness, um, because, and it's because of this lack of physicality, it's the lack of interaction that, that's happening. And, and therefore, students have got much easier just to switch off. So I've got to really start looking about how do I get people to interact in such different situations. The other thing, and this really struck me when I started online teaching, is that learners are getting through materials, the stuff that I'm preparing for them. They, you know, they're, they're taking hold of this and they're going at it at a rate of knots. And therefore, how do I get that extension or how do I get that spin-off to let materials that I've taken a long time to prepare last longer? Why are things only going on for five minutes? And it's like, right, come on. I want something else, teacher. You know, your greatness or your ability within this teaching context is like, um, is by how much stuff you can send me to do. You know, so an hour and a half lesson where I might, only, you know, in previous times before COVID, only had maybe uh, two or three pieces of uh, kind of text to deal with or um, topics to deal with suddenly I found myself right I'm really got to start planning now my god but planning has suddenly become this massive headache because I need huge amounts of material because people are just eating through it and therefore I've got to do something that's got to kind of combat this I've got to take control of this situation a little more and therefore I've got to think how do I challenge people how do I get them into to engage uh, in that sense. Uh, and OK, well, thanks, people who are saying, you know, I don't think online teaching is so different. Well, you know, it's good to hear because at the end of the day, the, these are my thoughts, I suppose. And if you've got something different, it's going to be good to hear from you. Um, I think I miss the physicality of your interaction and, and in some ways that physical ability to praise easily. You know, um, I think praise is a really important part of our lesson and, and the way the teacher presents themselves. So how do we how do we do that? I find now back in the classroom we're using a lot of strategies online. Yeah, and that's good to see. Maybe we can start learning things. And uh, so I'm just looking at what people are putting up in the chat here. Uh, things in our yeah, it's so hard to time things whether it is too much. Yeah, absolutely. Timing is, is, is I think, really actually how much you're going to do. Um, uh, the other thing that I, I studied quite a lot when uh, through English language and through secondary education, there was a big focus on formative assessment. You know, when are students ready to move on? When do you know that they've got it? And I suppose when I was in... Um, uh, when I was in the classroom, you know, there the, were these kind of subtle hints that you can have from people. Um, you know, the heads are down, so they're like really engaged in something. The hand goes up to get more information or the ability to reflect on it easily. And therefore, sometimes in the online classroom, I feel like I'm, I've kind of lost control of that ability to be able to see whether students are kind of being able to 
they've formed enough knowledge in something to be able to progress and move on with it to the next stage. So these are my thoughts. And therefore, where we're going to move on to now is kind of, well, how do I tackle that? And how do I bring a little bit more control? How do I get more interaction? How do I get more challenge? How do I get more uh, engagement from our students? I think the first thing to note is let's just talk about the brain a bit and let's talk about how challenge comes from. And there's this part of your brain and the picture really kind of summarises it. It's right in the middle of the brain and it's called the reticular activating system. So if you have a think about it in your day to day life, all the things that you smell, all the things that you see, all the things that you hear, all the things that you touch, if, you, if your brain thought everything was important, every single sound, speech, smell, taste, touch was important, you'd, your brain would fry. And therefore, there's this really important part of your brain that basically switches your consciousness off because otherwise it would just be complete overload. So when I go back to... I was listening to a lecture the other day with Erasmus Plus and the stuff that they were saying was really important and I knew I needed to get to grips with it, but there was something in my brain that was telling me like, I feel a bit tired, I feel a little bit hungry, I'm actually just going to switch off now and I'm just going to become passive in this situation and it's just going to kind of go over my head. And I know that these things are happening and this part of my brain is kicking in because I start to scribble on a page and I start drawing little mimics or little diagrams. I think I actually draw a, a nice 3D plane instead of listening to what this guy was saying about how to fill these forms in. And that's because this part of my brain is kicking in and it's stopping me. It's saying this is just background noise, ladies and gents. And therefore, this is where this kind of passiveness starts to kick in because there's lack of this interaction, lack of physicality means that this reticular activating system starts saying, well, ah, look, this might be really interesting, but look, guys, it's time to think about lunch rather than thinking about uh, what I need to be doing uh, with the present perfect tense. So we've got to start thinking about, or for myself and for people, about how do I get that reticular activating system working so that what I'm saying starts making sense and starts being important within the classroom context. So I suppose the things that are going to kick in to get that reticular activating system kind of switched off, we need to start thinking about challenge. If, I'm just reading the chat here. I'm doing too so much. Okay. My class is so much too, too kind of different. Yeah, it really is um, difficult to uh, deal with different learning styles. It, it's just one of the challenges that we've got. So what do I do? So uh, I say, first off, I'm going to challenge my students. I'm going to think about engagement of my students. I'm going to think about how do they progress within the classroom. I'm going to definitely think about so that I'm not stuck into having to plan huge amounts of materials. Where are my spin-off opportunities? I'm going to think about how do I interact with my students? I'm going to think about how do I extend my activities to keep them challenged? Hold on one sec. I'm going to think about control. You know, there's still, you are the teacher, you're the facilitator. How do you control your students? I'm going to think about assessment. I'm going to think about praise. So these kind of eight or nine elements are what I'm thinking through my brain on a day-to-day -day basis when it comes to planning. And instead of thinking about particularly, all oh, right, timing or here's my starter and here's my main part and here's my plenary. I'm kind of pushed those things aside when I'm thinking about online teaching. And these are the areas that I'm thinking of. Now, maybe it's time to think about in our day to day lifetime, when we're back in the classroom, when we're thinking about uh, students 
uh, and what we do when we can physically see them again and we can interact with them again, maybe these are the areas that maybe we should be starting to look at more. So the first big question is this wimp factor, and it's about what's in it for me. If we don't address with our student population why they're doing this thing, what's the reason behind um, what I'm doing within the classroom, then we're going to be really stuck, ladies and gents. So when I'm planning my lessons, the first thing when I open up that book, and I think about where I'm going to start. I'm going to start thinking about, well, what's in it for me? If I was the student, why would I want to, to do this? And I think unless we deal with challenge in this situation and challenging our students, then, you know, our lessons are going to be really difficult and tedious. Now, here's an important part when we talk about challenge. Challenge and stress are two very similar things. If we challenge a student too much too quickly, then it can turn into stress. And therefore, you know, let's just break down what I mean by stress and what I mean by challenge. Stress is your driving test. And I remember my one really positively. The, my uh, driving test instructor was about six foot four and as, as wide as he was tall. And I was taking my test in a, in a 1983 Mini, which was a bit dilapidated. And the, I always remember his first question as he kind of squeezed himself into my little hot car was that, did it have a valid NCT? And secondly, did the windows work? Now, I can tell you the first answer was yes, and the second answer was no, but that was stress. Uh, and we've got to be careful with stress. So, for example, I generally don't start lessons by testing my students because I think the stress level comes up and therefore the engagement goes down. I want to challenge people. I don't want to stress them out. Now, when I talk about stress, it's important that there is some stress. It's not that we're discarding all levels of stress, because if there's no stress in your life, you'd never do anything. You'd never get out of bed. So we've got to be careful about our balance between challenge and stress. A, a quick up on the chat here, ladies and gents. Um, when you're starting your lesson with your students, because I did this for years and years and years, I asked this question, um, how was your weekend or how was your day or how are you feeling today? Uh, ju just, just if you can type in, ladies and gents, how many people are starting lessons with this kind of, or do you do it at the start of the lesson? Like, how was your weekend? How are you doing today? Um, what did you get up to? Anybody's response? Yeah. Yeah. I just want to ask, and I kind of ask myself this stupid question, why am I doing this? Why am I asking this? Why am I really challenging somebody in my lesson to get going at it by asking this question. I'm not saying it's not important because we do want to build rapport with our students and we do want to feel like we're included in their life and we do want to help them out if they've got problems. And this isn't just about online teaching. This is when I'm in the classroom. I remember when I first started teaching, I was 24 years old. I always ask this question, you know, what did you get up today? How was your night last night? And it was probably because I was in closer in age to my students and we were doing the same things. And I was looking for something to maybe fill a gap and feel like, you know, um, I was interested in them and they were interested in me. But as I've got older in my teaching career, I don't saying that we need to get rid of this. It comes into my lesson, but not at the start. I want to get my students working on something. I want to get them engaged into my lesson. I want to make sure that that reticular activating system isn't kicking in and it kind of just going over my head. Uh, so 
this is something that I want. I don't want to start with. It comes into my lessons somewhere, but I want to start them with something that challenges them. And what I say, well, let's use our online resources to our, our benefit in the fact that students are sitting at home and they've got more things around them that they can visualize or they can listen to or they can touch and they can smell. So I always like the simplest one is to start with a visual. So, for example, here's a nice visual. What can you see? Write 25 words. You're not allowed any articles. You're not, an, uh, you're not allowed any kind of present simple tenses. Tell me what you see. What are people doing in it? What's the person doing in the boat? I want to set a little bit of challenge. I've also set things, for example, um, bring along an item that you really like to smell, that you love the smell of, and, and tell us about that smell or an item that you really like the touch of. So it could be your blanket or your favorite jumper, but I want you to describe in words what, you, what that thing makes you feel. And those starter activities really challenge the student to do something, to get their head around and into the language. I don't always want to start with something like this kind of like passiveness, of how was your weekend? Because invariably at the moment, what did you do? Well, I did nothing. And what did you do? Again, I didn't do very much at all. The, the, my highlight of my weekend was going to Lidl's. And it's got a place within our lessons, but I need to kick off lessons by getting challenge going. So what I'm going to do now, ladies and gents, is I'm just going to take you through kind of one of my lessons that I like to do and show you how I do the challenge, the spin-off and the engagement. So here we go, ladies and gents. Um, when I talk about a visual, it doesn't have to be a very stimulating visual. I'm not saying you've got to go and be the master of a piece of art. Like this comes out of a little book. You'll see it here. It's called Prepositions. It comes from the 1990s. But here we are. And here's my visual. And it's over to you now, ladies and gents. Now, this is where you can grade. This is visuals are great for all levels of learners because it's up to you what you want to do with it. With lower levels, I would say, please name everything that you can see within the picture and write it down. With higher levels, I would say to people, can you tell me what's the interesting language here? What language would you like to know about that you, 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 you have some idea about, but you're not 100% sure about what it is? So it's over to you now, ladies and gents. And if you can put your answers into the chat or if you'd like to type up or, or speak up, please do. Have a look at the picture. Is there any language there that you think would be interesting for your students to learn? Are there any kind of new pieces of language that would be from that picture? That would be like, oh, yeah, that would really help my student to understand something. So it's over to you. I'm looking at the chat now. Any, any interesting or useful language from what you can see in the picture? Yeah, it's about prepositions and place, absolutely. But what about the, what you can see? Is there anything? Yes, yeah, cigarette, but absolutely. Any other thing? Comfort, music choices. Yeah, it's all about prepositions. Yeah, furniture and hobbies, but some specifics, ladies and gents. So I'll give you an example, like mantelpiece. How many of your students have ever seen mantelpiece in their life before? Any other thoughts of useful language coming in here? New language that would be useful for your students? Thank you. Yeah, record player, turntable, albums, yeah. Yeah, fishbowl. Yeah. Kind of what happens next? Absolutely. Cat and discussions on pets. Yeah. Cigarette smokes, fumes, semi intangibles. Lovely language here, ladies and gents. Thanks very much. Yeah. So if we just move on from the pitch now, now use, you know, remember this, ladies and gents, use technology to your benefit. Like, 
in the classroom where they would have all had a printed picture of this this thing and if you told them to turn it over some of them would be peeking at it or some of them wouldn't turn it over they wouldn't follow instructions with IT you've got this lovely ability to control this haven't you so if you said right I want you to look at this picture for 30 seconds and then uh, describe to me what you see or write down what you see you're in full control of this because it's online so use the technology uh, to your benefit so some useful language that I came up with that I thought would be good uh, for for tea, for students to learn like mantelpiece it's 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 a, a lovely word and where does it come from you know words like rug for example, like students never get rug because they always confuse it with carpet. Ashtray, where some people were uh, talked about cigarette butts, absolutely. Uh, lampshade or record player and fireplace, cushion and coffee table. And from when I'm planning and I'm thinking about that useful language that students might come up with, this is where I start to think about the engagement and I start to think about the expansion and the extension activities. And just to run through a few of those extensions that go through my mind, yeah? And I like to call these spin-offs because I know then that I haven't had to put a huge amount of planning into this situation but I've been able to create some extra engaging activities in what I'm saying. And I like to call them spin-offs. So for example, like what's the difference between a rug and a carpet? You know, I've had a 20 minute conversation with, with students. Yeah. Chimney for fireplace. Absolutely. I totally agree with you on that one. You know, what's the difference between a rug and a carpet? Well, a rug is the one that's in the centre of the room and it doesn't touch the walls. You know, this is useful language. I can see this on the face of my students because they're going, yeah, clothesline and clothes horse. Absolutely. You know, what's the difference between the two and where did it come from? Other things. Here's a massive one. Cushion and pillow. The amount of students that will call the picture that you've seen and just re return it to you quickly. It looks like a pillow, doesn't it? But it's a cushion, isn't it? And why is that? You know, one's for when you're asleep and one's for under your bottom at the end of the day. But where did it come from? And you can just engage in such lovely conversations if you can just think about where the spin-offs are coming from. Things like fringe on the rug, you know, and the connections with hair. Yeah, rug and mat, you know, the... Absolutely, ladies and gents, you know, the, the mat is on the doorstep and the rug is in your room. You know, why do we have these special pieces of language that are pretty much exactly the same thing? Going back to fringe, you know, so things like bangs and haircuts and all of these are just spin us activities that come from this, this simple picture. Um, have to go to class thank you all right coffee table side table and stand absolutely so the other big one you know cupboard shelf cabinet locker the the irish obsession with press and where it comes from like wardrobe for example i might have this wrong but somebody told me that wardrobe came from like louis the 14th in france because he had this little antechamber that was next to his bedroom which he sat with his generals and his colonels to talk about war and it was a little room or that he 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 met his favorite mistress at the time even if his wife was in bed next door but it was just like this little room where he kept all these important things so the fact is the spin-off here could be right go our way and ladies and gents and do some investigation into these different words that mean the same thing and then come back and let's talk about it but you know we as the teacher need to start thinking about what those spin-offs for are uh, people who, who who already put things like record lp you know, a lot of students will call thing this thing vinyl, but obviously that's the material that it was made of. And you can just see the catch and the engagement when you engage in that spin-off. It's such a simple, boring visual that I've given to them. But, you know, if we, the teacher, are doing the job kind of properly, we can look at these spin-offs and we can really engage with our students. The difference between a 
fish tank and a fish bowl and an aquarium is it just about size ladies and gents where we start using these different things but again it's a great spin-off bunch of flowers bouquet is this because one is more formal one's more informal did one come from latin did the other one come from viking times who knows yeah and they do get confused between plants and flowers and trees and your other point it's just coming up now yeah um clock and watch like for low levels like pre-intermediate students you know so many students make the confusion between oh yeah what's the time i have a look on my clock no you're looking on your watch you know here's a spin-off and they will engage and they will see that as a challenge it, it's such an important thing from every visual that we can do you know uh, the other great one you know uh, sofa and couch and settee and armchair and we even got these two-piece armchairs called cuddlers now you know this language that we're developing but students love those different language and the different sets I've had students who've online created little tables you know like what's the armchair used for like what's its description what's its benefits what's its drawbacks you know, to, to identify which one we better for them. Is couch comes from American language. It's these interactions which I'm talking about. Um, different types made, of di yeah, bowls made of different types of different materials and different colours and different, you know, bring a bowl into the classroom, why don't you, and describe it to your students. What I'm saying is, is what you're planning, and what you're doing, there's a huge amount of elements. You've just got to kind of think about where you want to go to. The, the classic one, why is it called a coffee table? Like, can, can anybody, would you like to post into the chat about why it's called a coffee table? Because I don't know why. Why isn't it a tea table? Why isn't it a beer table? Why is it not a Pepsi Max table? Why is it a coffee table, ladies and gents? You know, again, this is just a lovely spin-off from that original little visual that I've given them, that boring visual that will allow students to engage and challenge them. You're constantly challenging them to come up with ideas and thoughts to get that feedback to you. And I think it's so important. The, the other thing, ladies and gents, and as we all know, is that this uh, activity is to do with prepositions, isn't it? It's prepositions of place. And um, so I've got a 10 year old son and this keeps him activated because um, I get him to build me some little models to do it in my classrooms. And here's our prepositions of place model today. Uh, as you can see, I, I was really pleased with him with this one because I thought this one's going to take him hours to create. Yeah, five minutes later, he came back with this bloody great looking thing. Look at it. Uh, Van Gogh could not have done better because in my classroom, the things that I missed is that I would have got students to stand up and I've got them to move around. And maybe you're doing that within the within the, the context of your online lessons. But some of my students are in really tight, cramped accommodation. They, they don't like to kind of do these physical movement activities because they're worried about the students around them, how they're going to view them and, you know, that kind of confidence level. So sometimes I get them to do things like, well, can you build me a little model to do this thing? So, for example, uh, on my little model for prepositions of place, here's my cat. Hello, cat. We can see him there. And uh, the cat is sat. Can you just write down your answers, please, ladies and gents? They don't even have to interact. Or, uh, you know, a, a difficult one like between the cat sitting between the table or the cat sat on the chair. Or I can't think my cat's a little bit big for this situation, but here we can see he's trying to get under the chair or he's under the table. And if you want to practice things, then I find Lego such a good physical Playmobil is a great resource. Oh, we had we had a question, a, a statement back about coffee table. So, perhaps a European tradition to have coffee in a parlour and living room. Yeah, but is tea not more of a tradition than than coffee? I don't know, but yeah, absolutely. But these are the things that you need. I like to discuss with my students now. So, back to my little model. That it's just a bit of stupidity at the end of the day. 
I, I know it is, but it's just about that challenge and engagement. It's stopping them from switching off. It's stopping them from going, I'm sat in my padded cell or on my telephone listening to you and this is starting to go over my head now and I don't care and I want lunch and I want a cup of tea. I don't want to be talking about coffee tables and therefore I need to make them better. So Lego, it, it's a great thing to do with um, to do with online students and, you know, build something. There's always going to be something that they can represent in the classroom, you know, um, find something that represents this feeling, show it to me, show it to your peers um, so that we can we can move on with that thoughts. Um, I've just got to move the chat up here. Um, just a couple of thoughts here. Make sure, ladies and gents, that you're grading it to your spectator. Don't go over the head. Remember that thing about stress and challenge, yeah? Try and make it as either simple for them because they're lower levels or if they're higher levels, really push on. Remember that visual is good for any type of level. It's just about how you interpret it how you think about those spin-offs. Please use the technology to your advantage. Um, you know, and like I was saying before, you know, that great one about, you know, clicking into the picture and then clicking out of the picture, how much you can remember. It, it, it is a great way of, of showing your, your students, you know, keeping them focused on what they can do. And yeah, you're quite right. It's about hooking students. It's about once you've got that hook and you've got them engaged, then you can really take them much further. And this isn't just about online teaching. These are kind of ideas that I've had that I've used within the classroom as well. So when you get back into the classroom, don't just think that all of this stuff has to go out the window. I like where people have said, you know, what I've learned from doing things online, I'm now using within a classroom focus. Yeah, you know, this is how we how we learn as teachers to teach better at the end of the day. Um, you know, and here we are back at our, our boring picture. And I can truly say from what I've seen in the chat that we've been able maybe to engage more in this than we kind of first saw when we saw my boring picture of this, you know, of, of this room. And, you know, moving on, ladies and gents, you know, let's be clear about it. I do want my students to, you know, it's not just about spin-offs and engagement and doing extra things and having these lovely conversations. I do actually want them to actually complete the task. And, and, and here is the task. So in terms of my planning, it was one page out of a book, wasn't it, ladies and gents? And, but how do I get them to complete that task? Am I just going to give them this piece of information out and tell them to fill in the blanks and we'll just go away and check it maybe that is so because we've done so much talking and interaction that this is a nice settling activity now ladies and gents and therefore I'm just going to give it as it is or maybe I'm just going to crop it and I'm going to give them a prepositions and I'm going to say to them well can you come up with sentences now ladies and gents and check against the, the originals? Or am I actually just going to go back to the picture itself? Here's a picture and just say, right, this is all about prepositions of place. We've done our practice using our lovely cat and Lego construction that my son Matthew made. Can you write the sentences now? that are connected to this, rather than me giving you the activity. Again, how do I get my students to engage fully in what I want them to do? It's really important, ladies and gents. Um, further extension, and another part from this is, once I've undertaken that task, then I wanna look for that kind of freer practice. And, and this is where your breakout rooms start to come in. Um, can you describe your room? Um, can people draw? You know, it's not the fact that because we're using IT, like we've got to give up on the fact that the pencil and the piece of paper is a really important element within our classroom environment, because it still is 
a really important thing to do. Can you draw or, or see what you hear? Can you swap that with your person? Um, and when we come back into a classroom setting where maybe 15 or 20 students are there, you know, let's get feedback from maybe two or three people. Like hearing the same thing from 15 to 20 people um, is, you know, a really, really kind of boring and maybe lethargic thing to do. And, and therefore, let's not do it. And don't forget that you have to have control. Like, who does it? Who chooses these things? So have you got two or three students who are always going to answer you? And does that make you feel good because somebody is giving you some feedback? Or do you think, well, what happens to the other 13 that are in the classroom? You don't want to say much. You know, do I have to maybe challenge? Do I have to say to my students, I'm going to choose who gives the feedback. So you've all got to be kind of on your toes a little bit because it might be you today that has to say something. And I think we have to be, we have the ability to be able to do that. And that's not just in an online environment, but it's also within a, a face-to-face -face environment as well. More moving on, you know, show them this, you know, wow, I, I would love this as my front room uh, and my lounge with these settees and sofas. But you know, things like, well, can you find a picture of your ideal room, ladies and gents? Can you describe that? What does it make you feel? You know, as if there are so many extras and spin-offs and ways to encourage your students that just come from this very simple picture that I started off with today. And at the end of the day, in terms of planning, this took me, it's one side out of a book and, and a couple of internet images. But if we think about it creatively enough, and that's what's important at the moment, I think we can really make some impact and engagement within our students. So, yeah, um, with free practice, after that, I always like to go into something where it's a kind of a written form because we've had some interactions, hopefully, and I want to do something that's a little bit more concrete to tie down what's happened. So I often go, right, well, now we've done all of that. I'd like you to go away and I'd like you to investigate. I want to hand some of this control over to you as a student, as a learner. It's not just about me having to be centered here, trying to get you to interact. So can you go investigate your ideal room? Can you describe it for me? Yeah. And then take them to the next notch. Um, why do you like it? What are its features and benefits? So you can try and start to get students, if they can, to be more reflective about it. Um, can you think about associated feelings that are connected to this? Because um, I really want to encourage as much engagement within a classroom environment as I possibly can. Um, we talked about kind of stress and challenge. And these are my thoughts. And you might disagree with me, but I kind of try to get as much formative assessment in as I'm going along in my classroom uh, practice. Um, but I like to leave the kind of the tests to the end. So if I've done something, for example, on pressure positions of place, I know that I'm going to bring that up in some way again towards the end of my lesson to make sure that that progression has happened, that I can move on in my next lesson to something new. And therefore, the fact that I'm doing the test at the end of something can sometimes mean that it's not just going to be associated to stress because we've practiced it. We've done the spin-offs. We've gone through the major components of it. We've looked at the stupid Lego structure that's connected to it. And therefore I've removed the stress. I've not removed the challenge. I've just removed the stress to a level where the, the assessment can take place. So I can be happy that I've got something hard and fact on um, a piece of paper that Paulina has got 15 out of 20 with prepositions of place. And therefore, I know that in my next lesson, I'm ready to move on. Uh, yeah. Uh, and thanks, ladies and gents, for all your comments that are coming in about, you know, I'm getting you to hopefully, as you can see, activate your brain through this thing. One of the kind of last things that I want to talk about is about praise because I love praise uh, in the classroom and it's something that I really miss 
because pray to me was something that was done more physically than just saying putting a tick in a book or um, you know a virtual high five Um, the greatest thing that uh, a deputy head once gave to me is this little thing and it's a little stamper and I'll put it up to the camera here it says super and um, like I've had directors of huge companies who have smiled at me as they've written something I've been able to give them a little stamp to say you've done really well and that impact really breaks through all of that kind of monotony because they're like wow I've gained something from this so how are we praising our students when we're doing things online well a couple of little ideas um I don't know if you've got some of these I went and stole some from my post office they're these freebie postcards and it means that you can send a little message to anybody in Ireland and I've just written that you know, thanks for being a great participant in the lesson. I don't even have to affix a stamp to this. I've just got to chuck it into a letterbox. I need to know the person's address. But, you know, I know GDPR might kick in here that you're using, you know, uh, uh, you know, somebody's personal information. But at the end of the day, if you build up a good rapport with the students, then it, it's time when they've done something well to kind of praise them. Are we using, you know, we can email them to say, oh, you know, like you really worked hard within that environment. And, and thanks very much for that. Um, praise for me, you know, a good friend of mine uh, did her master's on uh, how to improve uh, uh, GCSE, which is like um, junior certificate art students by giving them treats. And she found like uh, Haribo meant that 25% more of her students passed her junior certificate uh, in art because they just associated that piece of praise, that physicality of that piece of praise with doing something better. And it kind of worked. And it and it goes back to human instinct, doesn't it, that we'll, we'll try hard to do these things. Um, I, I want to finish today with just a couple of good resources because... Yeah, excellent. Perfect. You know, thanks. I email my students regularly and I've seen sweets and worksheets in the post. Yeah, absolutely. That's how we've got to do it. So I like to always finish with a couple of extra resources. You might know these resources. You might be using them. Um, 